Welcome back, everyone. Next up, we have Rakovina Therapeutics, Inc. It trades on the TSXV under the symbol RKV and founded in 2020 with a vision to transform and extend the lives of patients with cancer. This has a team with deep experience in drug discovery research, preclinical and clinical development, and regulatory affairs necessary to advance breakthrough innovations to become potential life-changing treatments in the oncology field. So they are coming to you live from Orlando, just presented at the American Association of Cancer Research, the annual meeting, one of the largest gatherings of cancer research and pharmaceutical companies in the world. Rakovina just presented. I'm sure they're going to speak about that. So let's welcome Jeffrey Baca, the executive chairman, and David Hyman, the CFO. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you so much. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a, an exciting day for us. Um, so, uh, yes, we are here in Atlanta, Orlando and uh, just had a, had a very nice presentation this morning uh, of some of our uh, research data around our KT3000 series. Um, so just a little bit of background before we get into to this. Um, you know, we are developing a diverse portfolio of uh, drug candidates based on DNA damage response inhibitor technology. And this is a relatively new field in the in the cancer arena, um, but I can tell you that the excitement about this this field in general uh, here at AACR this week has been phenomenal. Um, there are literally dozens of um, uh, dozens of uh, uh, of presentations and symposiums on DNA damage response. Uh, a few years ago, it would have been all about immuno, immuno and oncology, but it's really the DNA damage response field that's really taking over in, in terms of the interest. Um, our team has been doing this a long time. Um, we are collaborating with the University of British Columbia to optimize our drug candidates to move into clinical trials. Uh, and you know, being able to present at meetings like this uh, is great recognition of the work that we're doing. So, you know, of course, cancer remains a, a leading cause of death. It's still a significant unmet need. Um, and the incidence of cancer is, is increasing. Uh, we have gotten to be pretty good at treating some tumors, but we have to remember that cancer is a very smart disease. And when we try to throw something at it to uh, kill that tumor cell, uh, it's trying to survive. And so there are always mutations and development of resistance. So our job as uh, cancer researchers and drug development folks are to stay one step ahead of that and, and always to try to do better and better for the patients that we serve. Um, our focus is in the DNA damage response space. As I said, it's becoming a very hot area uh, over the last several years. There are four first-generation products in the market and a lot of work going into the next generation, and we're very proud to be part of that. Um, we presented this morning a, um, uh, a presentation in the DNA damage response section of the meeting entitled uh, Bifunctional Agent of Dual Targeting of PARP and HDAC and Ewing Sarcoma. Uh, Ewing Sarcoma is a rare childhood tumor that is very difficult to treat, especially when it uh, comes back after the first round of therapy. Uh, and what we showed is that uh, the lead candidate that we were highlighting is active in the treatment of tumors that are resistant to other therapies. And then that dual functionality provides synergistic potency greater than the FDA-approved single agents uh, that target PARP or HDAC. Uh, and that's very exciting. And to be able to do that in a with a drug that appears to be uh, well-tolerated in uh, the initial animal work that we've done um, is, is really a great position for us to be in. Um, Ewing sarcoma, and people say, why do you, you know, focus on that as your first indication? It is, it's an orphan cancer market. It's a small, relatively small number of patients. But when it comes back, and that happens quite often after the first round of treatment, there are no FDA-approved therapies uh, for these patients. And these are sort of generally children and adolescents, so it's a very serious situation. And the five-year survival when the tumor does come back is less than 15%. But by focusing on a rare childhood tumor um, and having a therapy that we believe is going to be a, a very important there, uh, that provides some regulatory and development milestones and, and uh, pathways for us uh, with the FDA. So orphan designations, things like fast track and breakthrough therapy designations are available and also opportunities for accelerated approval uh, so that we could hopefully get this into the, into the hands of doctors to treat patients as quickly as possible. 
And there's also something called the priority review voucher, which is a kind of a reward for focusing on uh, rare childhood tumors where the markets may not be huge. Um, it's sort of a, a golden ticket to get to the front of the line with your next product. Um, and while we do have a pipeline of, of candidates behind the 3000 series, um, you can sell those vouchers. And over the last several years, they've been sold uh, on the market to f other pharmaceutical companies on the order of $100 million plus. So all of these things are great reasons to be uh, focusing uh, on tumors like Ewing sarcoma beyond the fact that we believe that we're going to be able to do great things for patients. But of course, you know, getting the product approved initially uh, in Ewing sarcoma is a huge stepping stone into major cancer markets like ovarian cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer. And so that's where the long-term vision is, is to move something forward in a, in a very directed sense towards Ewing sarcoma, take advantage of the regulatory pathways available to us, and then broaden out into major cancer opportunities as we go forward. And it's really those major cancer opportunities that have driven big pharma's interest in the DNA damage response space over the last several years. Um, there's been over $25 billion uh, put into DNA damage response uh, research in the last several years. Originally, a lot of that money was ac were into acquisitions. So Pfizer bought a company called Metavation. GSK bought Tesaro, AstraZeneca acquired a compound. And these led to the first generation products that are approved in the market called PARP inhibitors. Now we know how good those drugs are and they're wonderful, but we also have begun to understand their limitations. So our research and other research is really being driven into what is that next generation? How do we improve on that first generation product that has been approved by the FDA? And Big Pharma's money has followed. In the last several years, there have been billions of dollars put into preclinical research, um, research like what we are doing um, to develop those next generation therapies. And I can tell you that the Big Pharma companies um, were well represented at our presentation today, and it was very exciting to see them there and be able to talk to potential partners about uh, uh, the work that we are doing. So DNA damage response and the whole field, uh, just a little bit of sort of 50,000 foot background. Um, we have tens of thousands of DNA damaging events that happen in our body every, every day. Um, you know, cigarette smoking or UV light or what have you. And that damage has to be repaired. Uh, we have systems in our body that are very good at detecting and, and overcoming those, those, uh, those issues. Um, but in some cases, those DNA repair mechanisms can become defective. And we now know that certain cancers take advantage of that um, to, um, you know, form a tumor, um, but that defect is unique to the tumor cell. So if you develop a drug that targets that defect, it doesn't do anything to normal cells. So you ended up with a targeted personalized therapy that's much safer than traditional chemotherapies. So we put together a portfolio of three um, distinct classes of compounds, all different um, sort of shots on goal uh, in the second generation of DNA damage response space. We call them the 2000, 3000, and 4000 series. Uh, the 3000 series is probably our most advanced. That's what we present the data on today. Um, and the 2000 series is tracking a bit behind that as the, this is the, the next thing in our, in our, in our portfolio. Um, the 3000 series candidates, which is being shown on this slide is some data from some time back, but um, uh, we've continued to present additional data like today. But what we're showing here is that um, this dual functional molecule that inhibits both HDAC and PARP um, is, is uh, more powerful than an FDA drug that uh, inhibits one of those targets. And in fact, when resistance develops, um, we're comparing this to the AstraZeneca drug, Olaparib, um, you'll see that the AstraZeneca drug and 3283 are, are similar. The EC50 is a number of potency um, against that tumor. They're similar, um, but when we go in with CRISPR and turn on that gene and cause resistance uh, to, the, uh, to the AstraZeneca drug, you'll see that number gets very big. Uh, that means it stopped working. Um, but the 3283 molecule, uh, our prototype lead molecule here, maintains that act activity. So that's the power of this, the science and the dual functionality is we can overcome treatment resistance uh, when it develops in the patient. And that is very important because that tends to happen in pretty much every patient over time. Um, our 2000 series candidates are very potent and selective uh, for that PARP uh, enzyme, but we're looking for improving safety profile and improving CNS penetration. And you'll see here um, the bioavailability of our compounds is looking um, very strong um, in comparison to the drugs that are out there on the market already.
So we're going through a process of lead optimization in collaboration with the University of British Columbia. Uh, we're working towards selecting a primary lead compound in each of these series to move into human clinical trials. We have a dedicated team of researchers that work under the direction of Professor Manj Degard, who's an expert in this field. Uh, he's a professor at UBC, and he's the president and chief scientific officer of the company. And this relationship has been fantastic um, in terms of being able to create a very in efficient um, and rapid screening uh, functionality in-house, which means that I think we have some advantages over other young companies that have to send all of their molecules out to be tested to a CRO, which is much more time consuming and much more expensive than in infrastructure that we've put together. Um, and we've got some nice support uh, and recognition from major organizations like St. Baldrick's Foundation and other grant funding uh, that is, is, is recognizing the work that we're doing. Um, along the way, we've uh, accomplished a number of things. We literally, you hit the ground running as a company when we opened the doors uh, just a couple of years ago and being able to establish that research infrastructure, get the right people in place and begin to move lead compounds toward human and clinical trials across these three programs. And we've been presenting those data at major cancer meetings along the way, presenting that progress. And we're very pleased to be able to continue to do that at the AACR meeting today. So as I said, the most promising lead candidates have advanced to toxicology and pharmacology studies in order to designate a primary lead candidate to move into clinical trials. Um, we're looking to uh, ideally be in a position to begin that regulatory process of putting that paperwork together to start clinical trials with a 3000 uh, series molecule later this year. Um, we believe that the 2000 series molecules are very partnerable uh, and we're certainly having a lot of conversations around that. Um, Last couple of slides, just a little bit about the team. Um, it's a wonderful group that has worked together in the past across, across the board. Um, everybody here has more than 25 years of experience in doing whatever they're supposed to be doing to advance our programs forward, whether it's Mazdegard in terms of the overseeing the research in the lab, or you know, Dennis Brown, who's the chair of the scientific advisory board, who has overseen multiple products that have gone through the FDA um, gotten to market and literally created billions of dollars of shareholder value along the way. Um, David, uh, our chief financial officer, is going to talk about our finances over the next couple slides, and then we'll uh, wrap it up and take questions. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Just a quick snapshot of our financial results at September 30th, appreciating that these are getting a little bit stale. Our year-end audit has been completed. We anticipate our December numbers will be out um, in the coming weeks. The one thing that we do like to point out is that operationally, our monthly cash burn remains very consistent around that 170,000 per month mark that you see on the on the sheet here. And we do uh, anticipate that to remain consistent throughout the, the duration of our lead optimization work. From a capitalization point of view, we have just under 70 million shares outstanding with 9 million in escrow. Since going public, we've had over 30 million shares come out of escrow that remain in the hands of supported shareholders who have been buyers, actually net buyers of our stock since, uh, since we went public. The options uh, outstanding, the 5.7 that we see here, are all held by current management and research staff who are certainly incented to create value alongside investors at these levels. And the private placement warrants track back to our initial concurrent financing when we went public. And I would uh, point out that these were recently extended by, by one year as they were set to expire in March 2023, but have been extended now to March 2024. So, you know, really our job is to benefit patients by moving these drugs forward through the FDA, um, developing new treatments to meet unmet medical needs. And what we've seen time and time again is when we do that efficiently, um, or when a company does that efficiently, it creates tremendous uh, opportunities for, for growth in stock price and shareholder value. And so as we make progress, um, you know, moving from a preclinical setting into the clinic, uh, we anticipate that those kind of opportunities coming, uh, coming as well. Um, as I said, the lead program, the 3000 series, we're very, very pleased with the progress we're making there uh, and the other two programs in our pipeline are tracking behind that. So you know, the investment thesis of having multiple shots on goal, certainly drug development, we all have experienced and, and seen um, you know, that this is a challenging uh, thing to do. And so having multiple shots on goal to manage risk is, is always important. Uh, having a team that's done this before is probably even more important than that. And we're very blessed with a great group of people around us uh, that have worked together successfully 
successfully in the past. Our collaboration with UBC has really you know, catapulted us and accelerated the path of development for us. And we're very pleased that we've been getting nice recognition from peer reviewed journals and, and invitations to present our data at scientific meetings where we're able to interact with clinicians that are treating these patients, where we're able to act with potential pharmaceutical partners uh, and have some meaningful discussions um, at these kind of meetings. Um, we also are very you know, lucky to have a very supportive group of significant shareholders. Um, that uh, we are working with to make sure we have the capital to move the company forward and continue at the pace we've been moving. Uh, and we'll be, uh, uh, you know, we're very pleased with the progress that we're making there as well. Uh, and obviously we believe the valuation at today's uh, levels is certainly a great entry point and provides a, uh, an opportunity for significant value growth uh, for our shareholders. So with that, um, I will stop and turn it back for questions. Great job, gentlemen. Okay, let's jump right in. Uh, Linda wants you to talk about your technology a little bit more and talk about what gives you an edge over the many majors in this space. So the technology is, is small molecule chemistry. So these will all be oral pills. Uh, and they have been designed by a wonderful chemist called Wang Shen, um, who's, if, if people follow medicinal chemistry, is kind of a famous guy. Um, he has multiple products that he has designed that have gone through the FDA um, and made it to market, both in the cancer field and outside of cancer. And you know, these, having somebody who has that experience at the uh, bedrock of the company is very, very important. And what we've done in working with uh, uh, Professor Shen and, and others uh, is to say, okay, we understand the biology of these tumors. We're starting to understand why uh, patients become resistant to the first generation drugs in this space. And so let's almost like, you know, it, an engineering exercise, build something to suit that will overcome uh, that limitation. And so that's really our advantage uh, out of the gate as, as having wonderful medicinal chemistry behind us to rationally design promising molecules to specifically address problems that we know should be should be addressed. The other advantage is, is certainly the relationship that we have with the University of British Columbia being able to operate uh, within the DeGuard laboratory with a dedicated team. But that gives us access to tremendous infrastructure, literally hundreds of millions of dollars worth of infrastructure that most companies at our stage wouldn't have direct access to uh, without going to a CRO, which as, as I said, is much more costly and, and, uh, and, and time intensive. So that's, that's really, you know, the basis of it is, is the MedChem and um, the biology and pharmacology uh, rapid pace at UBC is, is uh, a second. Wonderful, thank you for that. Uh, Mark Mitchell says, nice presentation uh, and wants you to tell us about the IND filing. What's your expected timeline for this and how do you see this positively impacting shareholder value? Right, so, you know, in reality, you're putting a pin in the timing of IND filing is always a bit of a moving target until you have declared that primary lead molecule and we're still working uh, to make that decision. Um, from that point, um, the steps are, uh, something called GMP manufacturing. So you're do making the, the product that you're taking to the clinic at a larger scale. Uh, we currently make these at you know, some relatively small scales in the laboratory. Uh, under a very controlled environment, that the FDA will accept the material to be used in, in clinical trials. And that, that takes generally several months. Uh, and then from there, you're repeating some toxicology studies under, again, very controlled conditions that the FDA will accept to define the first dose that you're gonna take into human clinical studies. One of the advantages, again, of working with UBC is that we have done uh, some of that primary toxicology work in our animal studies already. So we're gonna have a pretty good idea of the dose we're shooting for, which should streamline that process as well. So each of those steps yeah, takes several months um, to put together. You can run some of that in parallel, um, but we'll be able to give some uh, better guidance on exactly the IND filing, uh, but certainly uh, the answer of as soon as possible, we're very anxious to uh, begin testing these in, in uh, humans. And certainly we're shooting for, uh, as I said in the slide, um, having that beginning that paperwork process with the IND uh, late this year, or early next. And a follow-up question from Mark, are there similar companies you can point to who've reached this milestone and have seen shareholder value grow? So I, I think there are there are, are fantastic examples, even in the DNA damage response space. Um, 
you know, the the molecule that uh, is on the market with Pfizer um, started at a little company called Lead Therapeutics that um, moved it. They moved it into a company called Biomarin. Uh, Biomarin was acquired by Medivation, and um, which was a public company. And then that company was acquired for fourteen billion dollars by Pfizer. And that's just a matter of progress of from exactly where we started to moving something into late preclinical into the clinic and toward approval. And any shareholder who was in uh, lead therapeutics or even in, uh, in Biomarin or, uh, or Medivation did extremely well along the way. And there are other, uh, many other examples across the cancer field, companies like Loxo Oncology uh, that started out with a lead molecule just like uh, Racavita Therapeutics has. Um, they were acquired for $8 billion uh, before their drug got to the market. So those are the kind of things that, that we are excited about in terms of a financial pers- or a picture. But certainly, you know, the main w- reason that happens is by having good drugs moving rapidly in the clinical trials and developing great tra- treatments for, for patients in the cancer field. And that's really what we believe we have and, and what we plan to do. Richard Hamke wants to know, what are your plans for a proper U.S. stock listing? So um, that will happen eventually. Um, you know, the U.S. is a, is a very different market and has great opportunities to raise very significant capital. Um, the venture exchange here in Canada has been wonderful for uh, younger companies to access capital that they may not have had access to uh, otherwise because of the liquidity in the market. Um, so, you know, as we move into clinical studies and, and especially later stage clinical studies where substantial capital is, is required, those are the times where, you know, moving in a stepping stone to NASDAQ or, or the New York Stock Exchange makes sense. It's, it's nice to be on the venture exchange because it is a recognized exchange uh, by the U.S. regulators. So you can really go straight from the venture exchange uh, to NASDAQ um, once the time is right. Wonderful. Um, we have another question from Richard uh, talking about your audit, asking, is it a U.S. GAAP audit or an IFRS? Um, we are um, reporting in Canada uh, as a venture exchange company, so it is IFRS. Okay, great. Wonderful. Uh, We have another question from Mark Mitchell. Uh, Mark wants to know why DNA damage response? Why did you choose to build a company focusing on this specific technology versus other areas of next generation cancer research? Well, I, I think the, the the experience here at AACR kind of kind of answers that question. Um, we believed a few years ago that um, this was going to be a very important area of research. The first generation drugs that came into the market, the PARP inhibitor, um, had you know last year collectively generated you know, several billion dollars in sales, and they're wonderful products. But like any first generation product, the market evolves once these things are on the market, whether it's a cell phone or a drug, you learn its limitations. And the solution for those limitations create bigger and bigger opportunities with each generation. And so seeing those first generation products in the market, which are all very similar, they all have similar benefits and similar issues, uh, that created an opportunity. Uh, and you know we could see where that wave was going to go. Um, and like I said, a few years ago, uh, AACR was all about immuno-oncology. And this year, there were well over a dozen sessions focused solely on DNA damage response. That's where the the wave has gone. And and we kind of felt that that was going to happen. So that's why we focused in this area. Makes sense. Nick Dunn says, there's a lot of talk about biotechs having trouble getting funding after the recent bank issues. So can you address how you are currently capitalized? And when will you need to go to the market for more funds? Well, um, certainly you can, anybody can look at our financials, which are very predictable. Our burn rate, you know, month in and more month out is, is pretty much a straight line. Um, so, you know, obviously we are going to need to, to raise additional capital. Um, as I said, we're, we're lucky to have some, some very deep pockets around the table who believe very strongly in the science and the clinical side of what we are doing. Um, and it's been made very clear to us that uh, when the time is uh, right to raise the next round of money, that uh, that's where it's going to come from. So uh, we're, we're in a great position in terms of being able to access capital as, as needed, at least at this point in our, uh, in our life cycle. And um, you know, we're looking forward to continuing to make progress uh, with the programs and building value for everybody. 
Wonderful. Uh, Michelle Fowler has a, a question regarding your burn. When do you see that increasing and how do you plan on sustaining it? So the the increase will really come as we um, you know move into the situation where we have that that mm. um, you know designated lead molecule getting you know heading to the clinic. So as we start scale up manufacturing, as we start the GLP toxicology studies, that's additional cost. Um, and you know obviously being a public company, um, we have opportunities to raise capital um, to support that. And then of course being uh, very blessed with some wonderful, very supportive shareholders um, who are very much behind the company, uh, we're confident we'll be able to do that. Wonderful. Uh, we also have a question from Mark D. How many different verticals are you striving to treat? Is it limited to cancers? You showed on the slides, or are you expanding? Uh, we're very focused on on cancer. Um, you know, cancer remains an unmet medical need in spite of all of the progress we've made in the last 25 years. Uh, we've done great things for patients um, mm -hmm. across the, the, the community, the, the life science community. Um, but like I said at the beginning, cancer is a very smart disease. Um, those cells, um, even though they're, they're bad cells in us, um, are doing everything they can to survive because they don't know they're bad cells. So, you know, our job is to continue to stay one step ahead and um, we think that there are great opportunities uh, to benefit patients and create tremendous value for shareholders for many years to come. And Norm Walton wants to know, if is your technology an alternative to chemo? Um, yes, I think that's a, a very astute question. So traditional chemotherapy um, was almost like a, a, a nuclear bomb. You know, any rapidly dividing cell in your body is going to be hit by that bomb. And that's why you see you know, a lot of gastrointestinal toxicity. That's why you see hair falling out. Uh, you know, that, it's a, you know, there's a, an adage of those therapies where a fine line between, between killing the cancer and killing the patient. Um, as we've gone on, things like the DNA damage response field, where we're actually targeting features of the cancer that don't exist outside of the tumor. And so by doing that, you end up with a much safer, targeted, almost personalized approach to treatment that is uh, quite distinct from chemotherapy. And Mel Gardner wants to know, what is the next trial we can expect to see and when do you expect results? So um, I think you'll see some additional uh, preclinical presentations uh, from us over the next uh, several months. There are a couple of major cancer meetings um, coming up later in the year. Um, in particular, there's an ovarian cancer meeting, uh, which is one of the major markets that we see an opportunity um, beyond Ewing sarcoma. Um, and then eventually we'll start to see us uh, presenting human clinical data, and we hope to be doing that as soon as we can. Mel also asks, what treatment is your technology planning on taking the place of HDAC, PARP? So the... It's, it's not necessarily taking the place of, although maybe eventually um, we move into the front line and, and are an alternative to, you know, for example, a, you know, a multi-billion dollar PARP inhibitor. In this case, you know, the patients are going to continue to receive the PARP inhibitor um, in, the, in the upfront setting. And then, you know, when they become resistant, for example, um, we would be the, the next in line in terms of that therapy. And that's generally how drugs evolve in the field. You start treating patients that have become resistant, and then you move the, the product forward eventually into the front line. And those are in the major cancers where the PARP inhibitors are already well established, like breast cancer, like ovarian cancer, and like prostate cancer. But in other situations like recurrent Ewing sarcoma, where there is no viable FDA-approved therapy, you know, that's a blank slate. And there's, you know, you're really not replacing anything. You're just giving a treatment option um, where one doesn't exist. Harold Lamb wants to know, are you sharing this technology with any majors? Um, you know, the, that's a, a, a process that evolves over time in terms of partnerships. Um, I think the the majors, if you will, were well represented at our um, at our presentation this morning, um, and there's certainly interest in what we're doing because it's unique. Um, if you look at the other uh, DNA damage response inhibitor companies that are that are out there, we're taking in particular with the dual HDAC part um, combination. It's a little bit of a different approach, and that um, that novelty is exciting to to big pharma because 
<laughs> they they like things that are novel. Um, so you know, I expect those conversations to evolve and and eventually lead to uh, some good collaborations. Wonderful. And last question due to time. Mike Ruiz wants you to give a little breakdown of your major trials and approvals to your best ability with our time. So in terms of the the, the team, um, so, you know, across the board, there have been multiple drugs that have been, have been approved. Um, my uh, sort of go-tos in the, on the team are, are Len Post, who, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, was um, at Lead Therapeutics and followed that drug all the way through the major uh, approval, or, excuse me, major acquisition by Pfizer. And that drug is, is now one of the four PARP inhibitors on the market. Um, Dennis Brown's uh, track record in terms of, you know, Matrix Pharmaceuticals back in the 90s, uh, Chemgenics with a drug called Synribo, which is for uh, AML. Um, and, you know, if you go to a major cancer meeting, there's just a giant Sinribo booth because it's become such a major product. So, um, you know, we've got a great track record of people are in, and uh, uh, approvals across the team. Wonderful. Well, do you have any closing remarks, gentlemen? Well, I thank everybody for, for um, your interest and in, in spending the time with us today. Uh, we're very excited about where we are Uh across the board uh, at Rackabita Therapeutics. We're excited about the accomplishments that we've had to date and opportunities to share them in major cancer meetings like AACR today. But we're also really excited about what's coming in the future and the opportunity to do great things for patients and unlock a lot of value for our shareholders. Wonderful. Well, we thank you for your time and we look forward to having you back with some updates and congratulations on your success. Thank you so much. Okay, everyone stay with us. We'll be right back with our next presenter.